And thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jen Rubenstein. I am a 2004 alum of The Ohio State University and the secretary of the Washington DC Alumni Club. Just some housekeeping reminders. All attendees cameras are turned off and microphones are muted. The presentation is being recorded. And if you have questions for Provost McFerrin, please use the Q&A feature along your Zoom toolbar. Also live closed captioning is available via the CC button on your Zoom toolbar. At the end of this webinar, you'll be directed to a short survey. Please let us know your thoughts about this virtual event as it will definitely help us plan for future programming, both virtual and in person when we can do that again soon. The Alumni Club of Greater Washington DC is a proud partner for this event. For any of you who are not already familiar with your local alumni club, you can join a club in your area to meet other Buckeyes close to where you are, to attend engaging events, watch Buckeye games together, and raise money for scholarships. I grew up in Northern Virginia and my first brood X or brood 10, should say cicada emergence was in 1987. So as a kid, I was always fascinated with bugs. I was the one investigating crickets and roly polies and sad if I accidentally stepped on an ant. So I just loved these huge creatures with the big red eyes everywhere. And I would collect them in containers with holes poked in the lid, the way some kids capture fireflies. As you might imagine, since I'm here talking to you now, that fascination hasn't waned. And I had just as much fun with them this year. I submitted a lot of pictures to the Cicada Safari app. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speaker and resident expert for this evening, Dr. Bruce McFerrin. As Executive Vice President and Provost for The Ohio State University, Dr. McFerrin is the university's Chief Academic Officer. In this role, he's responsible for the administration and strategic planning, development, and review processes for the university's academic mission. This includes leadership oversight of 15 colleges, five campuses, and more than 7,000 tenure, clinical, research track, and associated faculty, as well as academic programs for more than 66,000 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. However, you should also know that Dr. McFerrin is a proud Buckeye and a bug guy. He's an entomologist or an insect scientist, and he has been a researcher and an educator for decades, teaching many undergraduate and graduate level students in his entomology courses over the years. Tonight, we are eager to discuss cicadas with him, their significance, and answer some questions from the audience, as well as to hear more about the provost's experience as an entomologist at Ohio State. Dr. McFerrin, welcome, and the floor is yours. Jen, thank you so very much and good afternoon or good evening, everybody in Buckeye Nation. Uh, what a delight to be here with you. I, I'm honored to uh, have this chance to talk to our alums. Being an alum myself, uh, I just, I find it a special group of folks that uh, uh, wherever I go in the world has been a welcoming audience. As Jen said, I am a Buckeye for life. You know, that's the hashtag we use on, on Twitter these days to, uh, to highlight our alumni group. But I've added the additional hashtag bug guy for life because, uh, you know, Ohio State really has made me what I am. I was an Ohio 4 -er in Union County, Ohio, just right outside of Columbus when I first discovered insects as a project. And by fifth grade, I was telling folks on career day that my goal was to be an entomologist. Uh, I had to tell them what that was too, but uh, I've stuck with it all these many, many years. Uh, as an undergraduate here at Ohio State, I studied entomology and uh, went on to graduate school at the University of Illinois and spent a career as a teacher and researcher at Penn State uh, before coming back here in 2012. And in just a few days, I'll be going back to my, my home love of entomology in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences as my uh, time as provost comes to an end. Uh, it's been more than 17 years for me. I've spanned a few uh, of the life cycles of the periodical, periodical cicada, but I thought perhaps tonight we'd, uh, we'd start on a little journey across those 17 years and give you some, some insights into one of the more unique insects in the world 
uh, and uh, perhaps be able to answer a few of your questions. Now, as we start, I'd like you to do me a favor. Close your eyes, close your eyes, and picture a grasshopper. Everybody visualize that grasshopper. Now, open your eyes. Does it look like this? No, of course not. One of the uh, common things that you are have likely experienced is to hear about the 17-year locusts. Uh, locust is a common term that has been applied as a common name for cicadas, but locusts are actually a variety of grasshoppers. And so now you can actually gently but firmly correct your family and friends and tell them that they're actually talking about the periodical cicada, not the 17-year locust. Uh, so just a little fun fact for you to be able to, to address that. Insect common names are, are uh, curious that way. Uh, this is the time of year where we're starting to see fireflies or lightning bugs. Some people call them glow worms. They're actually not flies. They're not bugs. They're not worms. They're beetles. Uh, so again, just a notion that our common names sometime uh, lead us astray with regard to uh, how we identify uh, these critters. Let's go to the next slide, Emily. This is a, a map that's produced by the, the US Forest Service. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting just to show you the, the breadth of distribution of periodical cicada broods. Brood X, brood 10, it's not Gen X, uh, it's brood X, but we, you know, their Roman numeral designations um, is the yellow dots that cross uh, Western Ohio and into Indiana and the edge of Illinois. And then they jump over into uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, over into Delaware. Uh, and you can see that they're firmly embedded in a variety of other broods represented by the, the other colors that you're seeing here. With 17 year life cycle for the 17 year cicadas, and in the southern part of the US, 13 year life cycles for the 13 year cicadas, you would think there might actually be 30 different broods. And in fact, uh, as you see listed here, there are only 15 known broods. There are a few additional broods that have been known historically and uh, have apparently gone extinct. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on because uh, uh, human activity has had some impact on uh, a variety of the uh, cicada broods. The 17 year cicadas actually are made up of uh, four different species of cicada and the 13 year cicadas are made up of three different species of cicada. Uh, so across the range of brood 10 active right now, you actually have multiple different species. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the sound, but uh, they, they distinguish one another by the, the calls that the males make. Now, this is a map that shows the distribution by county. And uh, as a lifelong Buckeye uh, raised from childhood here in Ohio, uh, something really caught my eye. If you could go to the next slide, we'll highlight that. Uh, in the county by county map, in the center of that white box, you actually see that there's a county that is not yellow. That county is Hardin County, Ohio which became my home after we lived uh, here near Columbus and Union County. My family moved up to Hardin County, which is where my family started out and uh, my, what my wife's family is from. And so when I saw this map, uh, I became committed to filling the hole here because Hardin County could not go unrecognized as a location for Brute 10 uh, of the periodical cicada. Uh, Jen mentioned the uh, uh, Cicada Safari app, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, but it was an opportunity using citizen science to actually uh, provide some data that actually helped to uh, help us to understand the distribution of this insect. As you see, you can make out, if you look, if you squint carefully on the right-hand side, 
uh, you'll see the uh, emergence times. This map was actually made uh, uh, a few years back. And so for uh, broods one through 14, uh, the 17 year cicadas, uh, you see the year of their next emergence or add 17 years to that. Uh, the 13 year cicadas, obviously uh, either the, the next uh, emergence or add 13 years to that. And so um, this gives you a sense of the normal cadence of uh, the outbreaks, the emergences that we see of these periodical cicadas. It's an incredibly curious lifestyle. Uh, and I'll, I'll illustrate a bit of it a little later here in the talk, but uh, the notion of having such a huge outbreak of adult cicadas actually is believed to be an adaptation to overwhelming predators. And so the, the chances that you as an individual cicada are going to be eaten by a bird or some other predator uh, actually is reduced if there are tens to hundreds of thousands of you per acre in a given location. And so it's a, it's a, a technique that is called predator satiation. In other words, you satiate or uh, fulfill the hunger of the predators in the area. And so the bulk of the cicadas are able to survive and complete their life cycle. It's a very, very curious strategy. Uh, these long life cycles are not particularly common. Uh, the, as we'll go through in a second here, you actually see uh, uh, a series of four year steps in the life cycle. Entomologists call these instars. Uh, the eggs are laid in tree branches. And when the eggs hatch, the nymph, the immature cicada falls to the ground and burrows under the soil and begins to feed on the root of a tree. Uh, tree roots are very low nutrient value. Uh, the sap that they're sucking is very low in nitrogen, for example. And so this long life cycle is in part uh, an adaptation to uh, having to accumulate enough nutrient resources to continue to grow. The first stage or first instar is a year long. And then we see a series of four year instars. So for the 17 year cicadas, obviously that would be four more larval instars. Uh, for the 13 year cicadas, it's just three more larval instars. Uh, we do see uh, mistakes in the timing. And so, for example, uh, there's a good possibility in some of the distribution area of brood 10 that there were cicadas emerging last year, and there may well be a few emerging next year. Uh, and so uh, the timing is largely correct, but uh, occasional mistakes are made. And it's thought that that's how some of the, the broods may actually have originated uh, over uh, the evolutionary history of this insect. Let's turn our attention on the next slide. And uh, Emily, I'll ask you to, to start the video if we can, and hopefully uh, there'll be a familiar sound here. you hear is probably not as loud as you've experienced if in fact you were in uh, an area with a, a, a substantial emergence this year. The decibel levels can get up in the 90 to 100 decibel range, which is uh, the sound level of, for example, uh, running a lawnmower and walking behind your lawnmower. Uh, many of you would probably swear it's even louder than that if you've, if you've uh, been trying to have a picnic out back and, and had to compete with this year's uh, emergence. The calls actually are by the male cicadas, and they make a series of different calls. If any of you have tried to pick up a cicada and hold it, and it's a male cicada, you may actually have heard a, a short, sharp burst of noise which is an alarm call, but the majority of the calls that you hear actually are the mating calls. You'll recall that I said there were multiple species. 
within the emergence this year. And each of those species has uh, slight, but, uh, but certainly notice, noticeable to uh, members of their own species difference in their call pattern. And it is the males chorusing uh, often in the tops of trees in sunny areas that attracts in the females and mating occurs there. And so the, the different species actually sort out by responding to a male making the appropriate call. Let's go to the next slide. This year, I happened to actually stumble upon in my backyard here in the north side of Columbus, uh, a cicada nymph just uh, emerging into the adult phase. I've put a timestamp on the next several slides so that you can actually get a sense of the, the pacing of this. So uh, this nymph, the brown case that you see that you've often noticed uh, hanging on empty on uh, uh, tree branches, for example, that nymph crawled up out of its, its burrow in the soil where it had been feeding on roots for the past 17 years, uh, latched on to the bark of this tree, and the adult began to emerge or eclose, as we say in, in the business. Uh, you can see a couple of interesting things here. To begin with, you can see that the wings are very small. Uh, they've been uh, developing, but not expanding to adult type wings throughout the, the immature life of the cicada. You can see that its eyes are red, a characteristic of, of these periodical cicadas. If you look carefully uh, at the junction of where the cicada is emerging from its uh, exuvium or shell, you can see a series of white uh, strings. Those white strings are actually the breathing apparatus of the, of the cicada. Insects have their skeleton on the outside of their body, unlike us, an exoskeleton. And to grow, they have to shed that skeleton and come out and expand to a larger size and then uh, uh, move on with the next phase of their life. But insects also don't have lungs. The oxygen comes in through a series of tubes that branch more and more finely uh, inside the insect body. And that's true not only, only of cicadas, but of all insects. And it just so happens in this particular photo, you can see the, the uh, trachea or tubes, the, the breathing tubes that uh, are left behind from the nymphal stage. So the adult cicada, has the uh, versions of those developing inside its body. Note that this was at 846 on Saturday evening. Uh, Emily, the next slide, a uh, different view a minute later. You can see uh, this is the underside. If you look carefully between the front legs, which are at the bottom of the picture, you actually see the, the uh, mouth parts of the cicada. Cicadas are related to aphids and to leaf hoppers and to stink bugs. Uh, and they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They uh, uh, feed on, on plants as adults as well as immatures. Next slide. And so three minutes later, you see that the uh, cicada is fully free of its, its previous uh, shell, of its nymphal shell, and the wings are starting to expand. It's actually pumping blood uh, through cavities in uh, inside its body and expanding its body while the exoskeleton is still soft. This is an incredibly vulnerable period for a cicada. It spent 17 years getting to this point, and its whole goal is to be an adult that finds a mate and passes on eggs to the next generation. And so the remarkable thing here is the pace at which all of this happens. So 17 years since that insect went underground. Now it's come out of the ground in a period of about five minutes, it's gone from being the brown nymph that crawled out of the ground to this stage. Next slide. And so another 15 minutes pass and the wings are fully expanded. So you begin to see uh, that this looks like an adult cicada at this point an incredibly rapid transformation. But if you can imagine, it can't fly at this point. It has very limited mobility. 
And so it's very, very vulnerable to predation. All of this takes place in the evening into the, the dark hours. Uh, and so uh, a time when perhaps there's less predator pressure. Uh, when you look at this, I think it's interesting to note, you see the red eyes, uh, they have compound eyes on either side of their head and you see the three red dots. Those are called ocelli or simple eyes. Uh, insects have pretty sophisticated uh, visual uh, abilities and they're, they're tied into a couple of different uh, types of visual organs. The black dots actually are uh, places where the exoskeleton, the, the, the outside uh, form of the insect has hardened more quickly than the rest of the body. And we'll talk about that just in a second, I think in the next slide, Emma, if, you want, if you'd like to advance it. So here's an hour later. And so what I wanna point out to you here is the insect has gone over the span of about an hour and 20 minutes from a nymph that had spent its life underground to this form, which looks very much like the cicadas that we all know and dare I say love. Uh, that the exoskeleton is still translucent and very soft. And you can see a really interesting feature here. You can see the red eyes, you see those black dots that I referred to before. And then behind those black dots in the center of the, of the insect, you actually see two white bands. An interesting feature, at least to an entomologist of insects is that Unlike us, you know, we move our arms because the, the muscles are attached to, to the bones and we move directly. Birds fly and bats fly in the same way. The muscles attach directly to the bones and, and move their wings. In insects, the muscles do not attach to the wings. Instead, the muscles actually distort the shape of the thorax, the body segment where the legs and wings attach. And so the black dots are where muscles that go up and down in the insect are attached. And so they crush the, the thorax down and the wings go up. And then alternatively, those two white bands are the muscles that run front to back in the insect. And so the up and down muscles relax the front and back muscles contract and it moves the wings the other direction. And so when you see an insect fly, it's actually a very complicated physics problem that involves distorting the shape of what is like a box that you're, you, you get from Amazon. And so it's going up and in and up and in. Alternatively, uh, often in a very rapid pace in some tiny little flies, midges and mosquitoes, the, the wing beats can be up to a thousand times a minute. And so uh, it's a really finely honed uh, uh, system. So here we are at 10 o'clock, uh, about an hour and a quarter after we started monitoring this. Go to the next slide. An hour later, you can see that that cuticle is largely becoming uh, uh, sclerotized or hardened. It's actually a chemical reaction that turns a very soft, pliable material into something that's very rigid. Uh, and so this is getting much closer to the adult stage. And then uh, the next slide shows you what we have the next morning. Uh, and this is essentially a uh, fully formed adult cicada. Uh, this is a Again, this is, I know this is the same one because it was right by the, the, the cast skin uh, that we had started with the night before. And uh, even though this is less than 12 hours later, it is fairly mobile at this point, although the hardening of the, of the exoskeleton will continue for uh, uh, a couple of days before it's really ready to be active. Next slide. Now, I mentioned uh, citizen science and wanting to, uh, to uh, fill the gap of Hardin County, Ohio. Uh, my colleagues down at uh, Mount St. Joseph in Cincinnati partnered with uh, uh, cicada experts at the University of Connecticut. And there is an app that uh, 
allows you to actually take uh, photographic evidence and submit it uh, to be able to provide uh, geographic reference. Jen referenced uh, submitting a number of these. I have to look at where uh, Jen actually sits on the, the, the leaderboard, but um, I have submitted 46 photographs and I'm, as of this evening, number 1,399 on the leaderboard. So you can tell that this actually has received a lot of interest and it will in fact be really important scientific information in monitoring uh, the life cycle of this particular brood. Next slide, please. Now, they do want their photographs to be geo-referenced. Uh, I don't think this is what they had in mind that you find a cicada sitting on top of your trash can and actually just take a picture of its, uh, of it, you were there. Uh, but those of us who have uh, latitude, longitude enabled on our cameras actually uh, can have photographs of cicadas accepted to this. Next slide. The, uh, if we take off from where we were with that last sequence photo I showed you, uh, somewhere between four and six days after the cicada emerges from uh, the soil, uh, the adult really is ready for activity. They can fly, they can walk, they can make sound before that, but really uh, uh, several days pass before they, they get active again. And at that point, the males begin to congregate in the, the tops of trees, uh, begin their calling and attract the females, uh, and uh, the life cycle goes on, as they say. Next slide. Once a female has mated, she actually uses her ovipositor, which is a thin blade that comes from the back of her uh, abdomen on the underside of the body to cut slices into tree branches. Uh, and each of those slices becomes a chamber where she lays eggs. And you know, she may put uh, an accumulation of, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 eggs in each slice. Uh, in her life, an individual female may lay about 600 eggs. And for a lot of people uh, in the nursery business, next slide, this actually causes problems because it weakens the stem and you get what's called flagging in the horticultural uh, literature. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, folks um, suggest that you don't plant new uh, horticultural plantings, especially woody horticultural plantings in years where you expect a uh, cicada emergence because uh, you can see this damage. This is uh, actually the, the one slide I didn't take. This is my brother's hand. Uh, he's a horticulturist uh, growing plants up in Hardin County. And uh, this is a paper bark maple that he'd been trying to, to nurse along. And you can see that it's now going to have lost its leader uh, uh, in the, the central uh, trunk of the tree. Uh, so they can be uh, a pest, you know, every 17 years uh, is probably something that most uh, horticulturists or homeowners can, can live with, uh, but they do cause a bit of damage. The feeding on the, the roots by the, the nymphs doesn't seem to really cause uh, demonstrable damage to the trees at all. Next slide. So I'll conclude and, and maybe we can do a few questions in time that we have, but uh, I mentioned the University of Connecticut. They have a, a great team. Chris Simon uh, is somebody that I've known for years. She's an evolutionary biologist uh, who trained in Hawaii and actually has made her career out of studying uh, the life cycle of periodical cicadas and studying those various broods. And uh, the University of Connecticut has an incredibly useful uh, website and it's listed there uh, that gives you just a wealth of information, a lot more detail than I've been able to provide, uh, including uh, recordings of the various songs. And once you listen to the songs of the, of the 17 year periodical cicada, you'll recognize that in many locations, you've actually heard more than one species of cicada calling. Uh, the uh, Cicada Safari app 
You see the website there. Um, in many parts of the emergence range, the cicadas are still active. So uh, if you're a camera buff and not put off by up close and personal with uh, one of these six-legged critters, uh, you, can, you can actually join the fun and uh, uh, provide temporal and geographic location through your photographs. You do have to enable location uh, in your camera, but uh, you can then upload them through the app uh, and see if you can catch up with me on the leaderboard. I'm going to continue to try to, to push ahead. I would love to put on my resume that I was in the top thousand of, uh, of the Cicada Safari leaderboard before we're done. Uh, there was a terrific uh, overview in the New York Times recently. And one thing some of you uh, may have actually come across is the notion of insects as food and uh, the cicadas. Uh, actually lend themselves to a variety of different recipes. Uh, I will admit to not having tried any of these recipes, so I don't provide these couple of links and uh, a quick uh, web search. You could find scores of different possibilities. Uh, but uh, a, a topic for another day is insects as human and, and pet food. There actually is a growing realization that uh, our ability to provide protein by uh, farming insects uh, is actually a, a real uh, possibility. It has a lot of merit in uh, uh, a variety of different parts of the world. It was uh, in the mid 90s when I was doing work on invasive fruit flies in sub-Saharan Africa that I actually was at a conference in Malawi where they were talking even then about the ability to stop deforestation, which was occurring to make charcoal for, for local villages by encouraging uh, the villagers to actually cultivate caterpillars as human food and thereby saving the host plants that they needed to rear the caterpillars rather than chopping them down to create uh, charcoal. So it's an interesting uh, sort of business model and nutritional model that uh, has a lot of gives you a lot of, um, yes, this is a pun, food for thought. With that, uh, Emily and Jen, why don't we uh, switch back to the possibility of, of addressing a few questions that may have come in. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm taking a look through some of the questions. There are some really excellent ones. Um, a lot of questions that I have also. Um, one that just came was, um, Oh, I lost it. Why did they make all of their noise during the day rather than evening or nighttime like other bugs? You know, insects, uh, like a lot of other organisms, you know, uh, I would say Ohio State students tend to be very active in the evening and at night, for example, and our alumni certainly, uh, that probably resonates with them. They remember dragging themselves to 8 a.m. classes, but having plenty of energy at 8 p.m. when it was time to I'm sure, let, let's think, what were they doing at 8 p.m.? Starting to study, I think. Uh, that's your provost talking, by the way. Um, the insects do the same thing. And so these are diurnal uh, insects, which means they use the, the daytime cycle. Uh, other insects uh, later in the summer, for example, katydids, which are a longhorned grasshopper, uh, will be calling late into the evening and through the night. Uh, a lot of insects cue also to temperatures. And so uh, that's another piece of the puzzle. Got it. Um, can you tell us why they aren't in the Western part of the US? No one knows the answer to that question. Uh, all organisms have natural ranges in which they evolved. And uh, you know, this is the only place where this complex of species exists in the world. There are other cicadas. I mean, our audience is probably familiar with a variety of other cicadas, depending on where they are. There are some that are emerging now that actually have slight visual similarities, some of the same color patterns of their body to the periodical cicadas. But many, many people across the nation are, are familiar with the dog day cicada or annual cicada. Uh, and it usually is found, uh, is active in late July uh, through August. That is a cicada that, again, they all feed on tree roots, the sap of, of tree roots. So they have long life cycles. 
uh, but the, the what we call the annual or dog day cicada uh, often has a two to four year life cycle underground before it emerges. And so, you know, just as with all kinds of plants and animals, different species have evolved in different locations. We happen to have the great good fortune of this very unique life cycle here in the eastern part of North America. Got it. So are cicadas threatened by climate change or by human activity? Well, it's a good question. You know, you'll recall when we were looking at the map of the broods that I mentioned that there aren't actually uh, 17 broods of 17 year cicadas and 13 broods of 13 year cicadas. We know from historical records of a couple of broods that have existed and appear to have gone extinct. Uh, but uh, most of the broods that are, are uh, still numbered and, and monitored uh, are changing in their distribution. We were just discussing today with some colleagues here on campus why uh, folks in German Village and Clintonville were not hearing any cicadas, while uh, folks in Dublin and up in Worthington are deafened by them. And a lot of that has to do with land use uh, by humans. And so we've paved areas, uh, we've replaced uh, long existing trees with uh, newer vegetation, we've built houses and roads. So we have disrupted a lot of the areas. There was a brood and I, I'm not remembering which number it is. Actually, I think you likely could find this on the University of Connecticut website, but there was a brood in New England that has uh, uh, been extirpated, has gone extinct. And it's, it's widely believed that it was land use changes that, that caused that. Climate change is something uh, scientists are watching. The, the folks that study these cicadas are very interested in that very question because uh, temperature is a really important uh, component of controlling uh, the, the life cycle. The, uh, the emergence of periodical cicadas is triggered by soil temperature. And it's about a, a temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit at six to eight inches deep in the soil is the trigger for them to then emerge uh, and begin the transition to uh, the adult stage that I showed you in those slides. If we continue to disrupt uh, uh, temperature cycles, it's quite possible that we could see some negative effects. More likely is uh, the, the impact of, of uh, human land use. Gotcha. Someone had a question about if there is a particular element in the atmosphere that facilitates the hardening of the cicada's body. Actually, it's called oxygen. Uh, this is an oxidation reaction. It's a great question. All insects go through the same process. So if you see a caterpillar uh, on, you know, we have uh, black swallowtail caterpillars on our fennel in our front yard right now. Uh, and they're very pliable. Caterpillars tend to, to be very soft body and they end up turning into a chrysalis, the pupil stage, and then eventually to the adult stage. Uh, and the adult body will have that same, it'll have rigid wings and a rigid thorax. The, and remember I described the way the wing muscles work uh, in insects. That requires a very, very strong substance. And so, What's happening is uh, the use of oxygen to actually cross-link proteins. Uh, so it's very much like uh, cooking an egg. When you cook an egg, the heat actually causes the protein to cross-link and that's why you get on a fried egg that nice uh, uh, firm white. This is a different reaction, but it's the same kind of principle that actually takes a set of proteins uh, that are floating separately, if you will, in the outside skeleton of the insect and actually fixes them in place through chemical bonds. Got it. Um, we've had several people ask this question. I know this is something we've been hearing about a lot here in the DC area. Why are cicadas so bad at flying? Ah, well, you know, they don't have to go far is the, is the simple answer. Um, you know, the fact that they fly at all, they're, 
you can find uh, lots of stories about uh, physicists just debating whether bumblebees can fly while they fly past them. Uh, insects, you know, the, the evolution of flight in insects is a really fascinating uh, uh, thought process in and of itself. Uh, because, you know, think about this, birds fly and they no longer have four legs, they only have two. One pair of their legs turned into wings. Bats, the flying mammals, have a pair of wings and only one pair of legs. Insects have still, still have their six pairs of legs and also the two pairs of wings. So they didn't lose legs to create wings in an evolutionary sense. And there's a lot of work that has gone on to try to understand that whole process. So flight in insects is unique to begin with. In the case of cicadas, it's really just moving from that initial place where they've come out of the ground, essentially to congregate in the vegetation that's right above them. That's why the, the notion of human land use is so important. These are not individuals that normally can move great distances to a different forest, for example. Some of them will do long-term flight, but it's more likely to be bumping along you know, at, at low altitudes as they move from place to place. But generally, uh, they're staying fairly uh, stationary in terms of, of geography, and so the flight abilities that they have actually matches that life cycle pretty, pretty nicely. Got it. Flight, by the way, is a very expensive thing from a metabolic perspective. And so uh, these uh, adult cicadas do feed a bit on, on plants, generally not on grasses, but they, they may use their sucking mouth parts to actually uh, get some nutrition from uh, a plant sap but it's often very low in, uh, in carbohydrates. And so there's not a whole lot of flight fuel for them. And so that's another piece of the puzzle in terms of the cost of flying is great. And uh, so it's really, let's get, to the, let's get to the mating site and start calling. That's the perfect segue to this next question. How do cicadas produce sound? Well, it's the males that produce the sound. And if you were to actually look on the body behind the wings, so where the thorax, which is the part of, there's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen is the three body regions of an insect. So the thorax is the place where the wings attach and where the legs attach. That's how you can always tell that body part on an insect. And then the abdomen is behind that. At the junction of the thorax and abdomen in male cicadas, there actually are uh, structures called timbals that uh, vibrate to actually create the sound. Got it. So how do we know how cicadas keep track of time and know when to emerge? That's a terrific question and the answer is largely no. Uh, there are uh, genes that uh, are encoded in all life that are clock genes, so they keep track of time. And so there's uh, a lot of interest now that we have uh, tools from molecular genetics to try to understand uh, how uh, different genes lead to the expression of different traits in organisms. There's a lot of examination of this, but to my knowledge, we haven't actually uh, really sorted out that timekeeping component. It's largely thought that the 13 and 17 year cicadas are related to one another by likely the loss of one of the four year in stars or life segments. And so uh, mistakes happen, different things occur. Uh, but the timekeeping works. It still is, I think, an open evolutionary question as to understanding exactly how uh, they can be so synchronized. I mentioned the problem of stragglers, of things that are off by a year one way or the other. So mistakes do happen. It's not perfect. But uh, anybody who has been in the presence of uh, an, incre an incredible emergence uh, uh, this year 
could attest to the fact that they're pretty good at timekeeping. Most of them hit, hit the money. Yeah, def we have definitely experienced that. I know we are reaching the end of our time. I have one more question for you. I know here in the DC area, our cicadas seem to have died off already, but we have a question from folks in Columbus. Do you know how much longer they will be around in Ohio? Well, I'll give you the answer I gave one of my office mates today, and I'll tell you what she said in response to that. I said, when asked the, that exact question, I said soon, and she said, I'm not sure your definition of soon is the same as my definition of soon. Uh, generally, I think by around the 4th of July, we'll probably not have, in most areas, probably will not have uh, uh, much of a, a racket from the cicadas anymore. Uh, they'll all be in the egg stage then, and the adults die off after uh, mating and, and egg laying. Because of the, the temperature control of emergence in any given year, as you move further north, you tend to have a bit later uh, emergence to start. And so then the, the adult life cycle might last a little bit longer. Often, you know, it's the general characterization is that from the photos I showed you of the new adult emerging from its nymphal skin uh, to the time that they, they mate, oviposit, and die is generally around three to four weeks. Got it. Well, as we're about to wrap up, just so you know, I did check my status in the app. So I have 61 photos and four videos with an overall rank of 1,097. I've got work to do, Jen. I have work to do. I think we started a little earlier than you here, but I'm, I'm Perhaps, guessing but you'll catch me. Well, I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed that I, that I zoom past you. Dr. McFerrin, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful insights about these amazing insects. Before, we all, before we all go, we also wanted to take a moment and celebrate Dr. McFerrin. As he mentioned earlier, after five dedicated and impactful years, he will be stepping down from his role as provost on June 30th and rejoining the faculty at Ohio State's College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. During his tenure as provost, Dr. McFerrin has championed this university's land-grant mission through his focus on accessibility, supporting students and faculty, and promoting intersectional research to address the most pressing issues of our time. Others have said this, and we proudly agree, you put the pro in provost. We got to keep the puns going tonight. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your service to your alma mater. And we wish you the very best in your next chapter. Thank you, Jen. I just would say, I know we've got to, to close up, but I would just say that I, I sorted this out after our spring commencement. I have had the privilege of conferring over 102,000 degrees to Buckeyes for Life about one eighth of the total alumni or the total graduates that Ohio State has produced have been in these past five and a half years. It's wow. very humbling, very humbling. That's incredible. Well, thank you so, so much. And thank you again, everyone for joining us. And please remember to take the one minute survey at the end of this event so we can plan more amazing events like this in the future. Go Bucks.